what I'm going to talk about um, is, uh, I'm going to go with this. Um, I, um, I want to talk about um, why I chose this topic. Um, I want to speak about uh, my background. Um, and then I want to speak about um, the background of the study that I'm going to introduce, um, the corpus that I used, the methods that I used for this particular study. Then I want to concentrate on these three word bundles um, and then talk a bit about um, a structure and function of the bundles and um, some implications and pedagogical applications to and um, where I, we go from here. So um, I have been working with formulaic language for many years. Um, in fact, um, I was very interested in collocations when I studied, when I started my PhD program at NAU a long time ago. Um, I had been working with uh, collocations. I was very interested in um, the um, extended meaning of words by collocation, okay? I was like very Firthian in my studies. And, um, and so I, I ended up at NAU, like many other people. I had no idea what corpus linguistics was when I arrived. Um, and, um, and I uh, took a seminar in discourse analysis with Doug Biber. And um, for one of the classes, um, the Longman Grammar had not been published yet. It was about to be published. And so he brought uh, copies of different uh, chapters from the Longman Grammar. And just by chance, my chapter was chapter 13 that I was supposed to read and discuss for the following class. And if you have any idea, chapter 13 in the Longman Grammar is lexical experience expressions in spoken and written um, uh, English. Uh, it's uh, lexical bundles, um, idioms, and other formulaic expressions. So I think that the rest is history because when I read that chapter, I realized that that was exactly what I wanted to continue studying uh, for my dissertation and also for the rest of my probably academic career. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why, why lexical bundles um, have become such an um, important formulaic construct these days. And then um, I and what I've been doing with bundles, I studied bundles across languages. I started with English, but I went back to Spanish, which is my first language. I've been doing Portuguese. I work with Chinese with a student of mine and, um, and also across registers. And even though most of the studies that I do are on academic writing and different academic registers, um, I have worked with spoken registers and I have worked with other types of languages. Um, now, I want to speak a bit about this um, idea of lexical bundles as building blocks. So at the end of the presentation, I will give you some ideas on how to exploit that for pedagogy, especially. Um, I started working um, with lexical bundles, looking at four word bundles, but when I... Um, when I um, did my, one of my uh, latest studies, uh, I started in 2013 looking at longer expressions. So um, 2013, 2014, I discovered these nine word and 10 word bundles, which I thought were very interesting expressions to look at. Um, in 2014, I did a study with Elena Cotos, who was my former student at Iowa State on um, lexical bundles in methodology sections, and we found these 10 word expressions that were very frequent in methods. But I had never looked at three word bundles. So um, a couple of years ago, I said, well, why not? Why, why did this happen? Why are three word bundles the neglected member of the bundle family? So, um, if you have never seen a bundle or you have never heard of lexical bundles, I think that you need to know that lexical bundles are sequences of three or more words that commonly go together in natural discourse. That is the definition that Biber and his collaborators coined in the Longman Grammar. Um, these lexical bundles are identified by a specially designed computer program. Um, and the way in which they are identified Make, makes them um, one of the only, if not the only linguistic feature that is um, completely corpus driven. Okay, so that means um, you, you use a 
completely corpus-driven approach to identify bundles. <clears throat> when you run any program to get uh, n-grams or bundles, you have no um, intuition or preconception. Um, you may have a hunch of what you're going to get, but you don't know until the program finishes running and you get your um, expressions. Now, um, a word combination must recur frequently in order to be considered a lexical bundle, and this is very important because, in fact, frequency is the only quality of lexical bundles, okay? They don't have any other quality. They have um, some other um, things that are important, but, but the quality is that they are frequent. And so I think that it, we must be very careful because if uh, lexical bundles or any expression has to be very frequent to be considered a bundle, we really need to be conservative with them so that we are sure that what we are working with are lexical bundles and not something else. Now, um, for example, in the Longman grammar, a four-word combination had to repeat or occur 10 times in a million words uh, to be considered a bundle. Um, I'm a bit more conservative. I've never worked with 10 times. I usually do 20 times, 40 times, because I want to um, make sure that the expressions I work with are, are really frequent and that, I mean, there's no doubt that those expressions are um, very uh, recurrent, that they recur all the time. It's also important to have some cutoff point for range or dispersion so that we can avoid idiosyncrasies and we are not looking at the use of these expressions by only one or two users in, in, in a particular uh, group of texts. Now, in the literature, um, Lexical bundles have been considered building blocks that are use, usually uh, used by speakers and writers in a register. And I want to um, talk a bit about this um, after I do my three-word bundle study presentation. And if you have never seen a lexical bundle, here you have some examples. Uh, in academic prose, a very frequent forward lexical bundles had expressions like as a result of, on the other hand, the context, in the context of, or as well as they, among many others. Now, let's talk a little bit about bundles, and I want to give you my perspective of bundles. Um, Bundles have become an important, a very important construct in discourse analysis. So, um, numerous studies have been and continue to be published on top journals in applied linguistics and in corpus linguistics on lexical bundles. As the editor of English for Specific Purposes, one of the editors, um, I can tell you that every other day I get a paper on lexical bundles. So they have become a very salient formulaic construct. Um, now, of course, the bulk of the research that is done with bundles is done on academic registers, but the reason for that is that there's, um, it's easier to collect a written corpus than a spoken corpus, of course, and um, I mean, there are um, people or researchers have much more access to um, uh, written um, registers, uh, academic registers that they can collect corpora from. And so that's the reason why there are so many um, studies of bundles in academic registers. Um, now, one of the things that I've discovered through the years is that, of course, uh, lexical bundles have a particular fun forms, the structures, and they have a particular functions. But I also um, um, found out that uh, lexical bundles are closely connected to the communicative purposes that writers and speakers uh, try to perform in discourse. Um, and so, like uh, my latest studies, I try to make connections between the um, lexical bundles and these communicative purposes, going a step further from simple functions. Um, and I, I also think that um, if we look at them, um, carefully, and um, they can become important building blocks when teaching um, particular registers, okay? And we'll talk a bit about that in the, at the end of the presentation. So, um, what's the impetus of uh, studying three-word bundles? Well, 
With few exceptions, most published studies um, of lexical bundles focused on forward bundles, and then lately, uh, longer bundles. But there are very, very few studies of three-word bundles. Um, Biber and his collaborators considered uh, three-word bundles a kind of extended collocation an extended collocational association, they called. Um, meaning that because there are three words, they are in the middle between a two-word lexical collocation and a four-word more functional uh, expression, like a, a four-word bundle. That's not exactly what I found out, so we'll go back uh, to that in a little bit. Um, so my idea was to explore uh, frequent three-word expressions because when I teach academic writing to international graduate students, I like to teach um, moves in research articles or in um, book reviews, and then I want to teach language that goes with those moves. And so it, my idea was 100% pedagogical. Okay, I have been um, teaching these four and five word bundles when I teach academic writing. Let's see if there is something in three word bundles that I can add to my, um, to my teaching. And then I was reading, I was writing an article and I was looking for um, some um, literature. Um, and I found this article by Highland from 2012. And he says these uh, three word bundles are extremely common and seem not to be very interesting. So I just really f felt very sorry for three word bundles because they were considered not very interesting. And I wanted to see if in fact that was so or not. I didn't find a lot of studies in the literature on three-word bundles. I only found a study by Usar from 2017 in which she studied three-word bundles in English and Turkish, Turkish academic writing. And then um, the study by Salazar in her book um, on lexical bundles um, in which she analyzes bundles in native and non-native scientific writing uh, has three and four-word bundles, but there is not a very big distinction between three and four-word bundles. So some sections of the analysis of three-word bundles are, are a bit problematic. So, when I was reading the, 20, the Highland 2012 article, I came up this quote. Um, it said, um, it, is clear, um, it is clear that many four or five word bundles such as on the other hand, and it can be seen um, that ho uh, hold three word bundles in their structure. So that, and he cites me on my work from 2004. So I really didn't remember having written that, uh, but I went back to my article and I found that the following sentence clarifies that a bit more. It says, even though lexical bundles are frequent combinations of three or more words, the present study investigated the use of four-word bundles because many four-word bundles hold three-word bundles in their structure. But I was talking about my study, but everybody got that sentence, and just because I wrote that, everybody thinks that that is the commonality 100% of the time. Well, let me tell you, like the police would say, do me a favor, take care of this because it's not like that all the time. So um, some probably statistical analysis of three word bundles, I think it's interesting to look at them in comparison to other um, longer expressions. So three word bundles are 10 times more frequent than four word bundles. That means they are extremely frequent, because four-word bundles are already very frequent. And Biber and his collaborators said that um, three-word bundles uh, occurred 80,000 times per million words and um, 60,000 times in conversation and academic, and academic prose in the Longman corpus, okay? And, and then if you compare to four-word bundles, you can see that it's true, okay, that they are 10 times more frequent because forward bundles appear 8,500 8, and 6,500 times per million words. And the average three-word bundle occurs 25 times. <clears throat> and there you have some examples of three-word bundles that were reported in the Longman grammar in order to one of the part of the, the fact that there is, there is no. Well, for this particular study of three-word bundles, I use the corpus that I have been using for many years and that I continue updating 
that's called the published research article corpus. I collected this corpus. I started collecting it when I was working at Iowa State, and many people have used it for many articles. Um, <clears throat> for this particular um, uh, paper, I um, use the articles in biology, business, eco economics, engineering, and history, um, about 620 something text, 4 million words. This is probably an average of 6,500 words per paper. Um, I use my bundles program just because I'm used to it, but I mean, I also use Ancong or Collocate. And I use other programs for bundles too, but I have this program. I've had it since um, the beginning of my study. So I, um, I usually, it's very accurate when it identifies bundles. So I used it for three word bundles. And then I use Ancong just for, for looking at concordance in lines. So um, what I, what I said before about frequency in lexical bundles, I think that these cut off points that even though they are conventional, because I mean, it's usually the researcher that decides what the cut off points for frequency and range are, I think that it's very important to look at these cut off points carefully. So I thought that because three word bundles are said to be much more frequent than four word bundles, the cut off point has to be higher. Okay, so that you are very conservative with these expressions and you are working with expressions that are very frequent. So I chose to look at expressions that occur a hundred times in my corpus. My corpus was 60, uh, 4 million words. Now, um, of course, a hundred times in 4 million words is not very, very frequent. It's not a very high cutoff point. I just did that because I wanted to see what I got. And of course, it got completely out of hand because it gets out of control when you have a really low cutoff point for three word expressions that are so frequent. So I decided that for this presentation, I establish a cutoff point of 240 times or or more in my corpus. I continue with the five uh, texts or more that we always used. It's, it's a cutoff point for range that has been used frequently. But you're going to see that you don't need to have any cut of point for range because I mean, usually three word bundles repeat across a lot of texts. Uh, 250 in, uh, in a 4 million word corpus would be more or less 60 per million words, but we don't normalize in uh, lexical bundle studies because normalization is not reliable. So just think of 240 as the magic number for my bundles in this presentation. Um, I found 120 bundles, okay? And um, here you have the most frequent uh, in my corpus, the number of, in order to, one of the, shown in figure, the fact that. Now, if you look at these expressions carefully, you can see, and if you have read studies of lexical bundles before, you can see that many of these expressions are related to longer expressions, okay? So out of the 120 three-word bundles that um, I identified in this corpus, only 42 three-word bundles were not part or were not related to four-word or longer bundles, what we call overlapping bundles. Okay, so 65% of the three-word bundles were part of four-word bundles, but 35% were not. Okay, so 35% of those expressions, those 42 expressions, were lexical bundles in themselves. They didn't need any four-word bundle to become a bundle. The most frequent three-word bundle in this group, out of these 42, appeared over 1,000 times in the corpus, and it spread over 347 texts. So more than half of the texts had that bundle. So my first idea when I look at these expressions was they are not, they don't need to be neglected and they can be very interesting. So we really need to vindicate them. Um, I used the structural and functional classification as a preliminary classification. I used Biber, Conrad and Cortez 2004. I mean, I'm used to that those uh, taxonomies, so I, um, I work with them. Um, 
it was not something surprising that the most frequent bundles were going to be noun phrases and prepositional phrases with some fragments of other things. Um, probably the noun phrase has the beginning of a prepositional phrase, which in this case is just the preposition in the probability of or the set of. Um, then I had pure prepositional phrases, preposition, article, and noun, most of the time in this study, in this paper, between the two, of the two. Some complex prepositions plus an article, okay, such as the, because of the, some passive constructions used in the is given by, and then some two infinitive constructions, to be, to be there, to determine. Now, other expressions that we are not so frequent, these expressions don't overlap with forward bundles too much, like with the expressions in forward bundles. Um, existential they are expressions, there is a, there is no. Um, subjects plus v, it is not, is that the. Some quantifying expressions, um, coordination plus prepositional phrase, and the subordinator in order to, that is used to introduce adverbial clauses. Functionally, um, I put them, all of these uh, tables are in frequency order, okay? So the first um, are um, preferential intangible framing att attributes, uh, probability of, the evolution of, the distribution of. And then I found these um, big number of um, um, lexical bundles um, performing this linking function. So these subordinators and these complex prepositions um, uh, lexical bundles had the same function as any subordinator or any single word preposition, okay, linking, linking the noun phrase that comes after the preposition to the preceding discourse or linking um, the um, adverbial uh, information in a clause to the preceding or the succeeding discourse. Some referential quantity specifications with a proportion, a set of, I'm really interested in a set of because I had never seen a bundle with set. And so it, I was very interesting, interested in knowing how it was used. Then some discourse organizers, that is A, that is no, um, some referential with other things, and this is where the um, passive constructions come. Then um, this referential with a text reference, so dietic reference in this paper, in this study, um, some impersonal stance markers, um, to be a, to be the, these ones come up usually after an adjective, so they, they are part of a longer expression, but the adjective changes all the time. And then these grammatical only expressions, which are bundles that are made up of grammatical words. So uh, function words in which they and in the. When I did my first study with the Spanish um, academic writing and bundles, I found many four word grammatical only bundles. And so I created that category, okay? So expressions like en la que el, en la que lo, those expressions um, are all function words. And so then it's a, it's a big grammatical expression that uh, functions um, as a unit to introduce other expressions. Let me give you some examples of the most frequent bundles. And I'll also talk a bit about the collocations, okay? Um, and also the semantic preference that, uh, that um, accompanied the bundle. So um, the probability of was one of the most frequent bundles and was followed by usually a noun phrase introduced by a determiner, um, definite or indefinite articles. Um, there you have one nice uh, example. Um, increasing or decreasing the probability of a rear-end accident, okay? Um, that was 26% of, of the examples. Now, 46% of the examples of the probability of were complemented by an ING complement clause, okay? Um, sometimes with a noun phrase, or sometimes without a noun phrase. So in this case, without, without a noun phrase, of these variables, 13 had impacts on the probability of encountering an obstacle vehicle, and six had impacts on driver failure probabilities. And then the remaining percentage, that was 30 something, um, those are uh, nouns uh, without determiners, plural nouns or mass nouns. 
Um, another interesting three-word bundle is a set of or the set of, which I was very happy to find because I have never seen a bundle with that. And um, the nouns that accompany this bundle are um, research oriented. Okay, so we have actions, attributes, concepts, examples, individuals, instruments, observations, outcomes, samples, variables. So if you look at this example, um, the results are very sensitive to the year analyzed and the set of variables used. So set of was very frequently accompanied by variables, set of uh, observations, set of samples. So that I think is, very, uh, is a very important function of this bundle in academic writing. Okay, what are the implications of, or uh, applications of a study like this one? Well, first of all, it appears that three-word bundles have a unique status in the formulaic language spectrum, and it's a pity that they have been neglected for so long. I think that when I look at bundles now, I really want to start with three-word bundles. Um, I would have, like, I would be careful with um, uh, frequencies so that the study doesn't go completely out of, um, control, but, um, but I, I would really like to include three-word bundles, okay? Because there is more to three-word bundles than simply being embedded in four-word bundles. Um, and I think that these uh, three-word expressions need to be reviewed to complement other bundle analysis so that you, you, we can all get a more complete formulaic profile of research articles or any other genres that we had studied from a formulaic perspective. Now, I want to show you something that I do with my studies, uh, with my students in the academic writing class. So when I teach academic writing, I usually um, have my students collect their own corpora, uh, papers of their disciplines, and we go over genre analysis and we go over corpus analysis. So um, we go on to moves a la swales, and, um, and then we do some analysis of bundles. So I identify these bundles that I'm showing you on this uh, file. Um, they, these have been very frequently found in move two of research article introductions, um, which is preparing for present research. This is um, the um, part of the introduction in which we are evaluating the state of the art in our discipline and in which we are trying to identify what the flaws or the gaps are that we are trying to uh, fill in with the study that we are going to introduce in our research article. So these are um, expressions that are very frequent in this move. For this study today, I included some three-word expressions too um, that I hadn't noticed before. So for example, in order to blank, it is necessary to. It should be noted that or the effect of the starting the sentence or something and then the effect of the. Little is known about or there is no. So these two are like indicators of gaps in the literature. They are used for that and they are bundles. One is a, a five-word bundle or a four-word bundle. And the other one is a three-word bundle. Okay, so um, there is no, it's very funny because it's usually to the best of our knowledge, okay, or to our, to our knowledge. And that doesn't come as a bundle, but there is no does come as a bundle. Um, there is no previous analysis or something like that. And it is difficult to, there is a need to, and so that is also marking the gap, there is a need to, there are a number of, or some things, and there are a number of. So if you know the lyrics, the lexical bundles can be your music. Okay, that's what I tell my students when I teach these. Um, lexical bundles are part of what um, Flower Dew calls language reuse. So lexical bundle is the functional language that is used um, recurrently in a particular register. That is why nobody is going to tell you that you are plagiarizing if you use bundles. What you need to know is the lyrics of your song, which means the content that you are going to put that is going to be linked to the rest of the discourse 
with these bundles. Okay, so I think that that is in fact the most important um, um, way to use bundles as uh, building blocks. Okay, so it's like bundles are going to help you um, build this course. Okay, where do I go from here? Well, I would like to continue the analysis of um, the less frequent lexical bundles on my list. So going from 240 to 100 to see if there are other expressions that um, are not, uh, do not overlap with forward bundles and then they can, um, that they are three word bundles on their own, but probably not so frequent. And then finally, I wanna see how these three word bundles um, um, I mean, I want to study these three word bundles in other corpora to see how frequent they are across corpora, okay, to see if they come, like, if, if different corpora, academic writing corpora, uh, shows, um, show the, uh, the same type of bundles. I mean, we know now that um, academic writing is very pervasive and that they, it uses bundles a lot, um, so it would be interesting to see um, how much these bundles appear in other corpora. And that's all I have for today, and I'm happy to answer questions. I can see that I have some questions here. So let me stop sharing and go to the questions. So, um, is there any systematic way to establish a reasonable frequency threshold to identify three word bundles high to the person that who asked the question, who's someone that I love a lot. She was my roommate for many years. Um, uh, well, for three word bundles, I would say it should be 10 times what we think for, for um, four word bundles. That's, that's what I think. So if you think that an expression can be a bundle uh, when it appears uh, or occurs 10 times, then go with 100 times. Okay, in a million words. Um, I think that that would be safe to say something like that. Now, if you're a bit more conservative, probably if you have a million words, uh, do 200. Okay, I think that the important thing with bundles is not how many you get, but the functions and the structures that they have. And if you get just a little pool of lexical bundles, it doesn't matter as long as they are really frequent. Because I mean, this is not a contest to see who gets many or more. Okay, so it's like, this is just uh, the idea of these expressions are very, very frequent. Let's see what they do. Okay, why are they so frequent in, this, uh, in these particular texts? I hope I answer you this question. Um, considering that the proposition in the lecture is using lexical bundles as building blocks, is there a classification that indicates which bundles map to which genre? Um, I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't know. But I know that there are bundles that are like tied to only one genre. And um, I did, um, I did um, movies with Marsha. Um, um, we did uh, bundles in, in movies and, um, and we found that they were more, um, they were nearer to bundles in conversation than bundles in other registers. Um, how, so I have a pool of bundles that appear in academic uh, writing. So every time that I see a study that um, looks at bundles in a particular uh, register in academic writing, I just copy those bundles so that I can have a, a larger um, variety of bundles. Um, but I don't know if anybody has done like a comparison across genres with lexical bundles. I tell you, I have to be really honest, we have been working with bundles for 20 20 years and we still don't know a lot of things about bundles because not people are not doing uh, studies in other registers like in more varied registers um, how discipline specific is the corpus and the lexical bundles analyzed um, I didn't do um, um, discipline specific because this was very exploratory. I just wanted to know. My main my main research question was how many um, how many bundles are not related to four word bundles. How many three word bundles? Uh, that when, whenever there was a case that there was no overlap between three word and four word bundles. 
Um, but um, I have done like, like mini studies of um, lexical bundles in academic disciplines. And I think that, um, uh, stay tuned because something is coming soon with more um, discipline specific bundles. And let me see the last one. Um, this was an amazing one. What would the cutoff frequency point for corpora that are less than a million? Oh, this is a wonderful question. This is a wonderful question. I think if you want to follow my advice, get 10 as your cutoff point, no matter how small your corpus is. Why? Because as normalization doesn't work with lexical bundles, if you have an expression that repeats 10 times and your corpus is 70,000 words, you have a bundle because if the corpus were a million, you would also have a bundle. At least for Bible at all, it was 10 times the cutoff point. So if you have a small corpus, but you have an expression that repeats 10 times and repeats in five takes, you have a bundle. So I think that the idea is don't go down, okay? Don't go down and, uh, in, in cutoff points and then um, normalize because, you know, normalization usually bulks up numbers and that doesn't work with bundles. So use a, a very conservative cutoff point and go with that. And nobody's going to tell you your corpus is too small because if you have a million words, 10 or 20 times is the usual cutoff point. So if you have 100,000 words and you have expressions that repeat 10, 10 times, they, they work well too, okay? Those are going to be bundles no matter um, how small the corpus is, okay? Um, okay, I, um, I have other questions, but I think that I, I must have gone over time or something. Oh no, I have time? Okay. It says, how can I yes, decide? Okay, how can I decide on what counts as a lexical bundle and what does not? For example, can sequence, sequences like of the target language, pre-test, post-test, control group in the English language, access to higher education be treated as lexical bundles? It will all depend on your research questions and what you are doing. If what you are doing is exploratory and you want to see which are the most frequent expressions in a particular uh, register, for example, this must be probably um, a corpus of second language acquisition papers, okay, because they have all these pre-test, post-test control group of the target language. It must be second language acquisition. So. Um, and you want to see, of course, I mean, the only quality that three words or four words have to have to be a bundle is like they have to meet those kind of points that are 100% conventional. So, I mean, if they are very frequent, they are going to be bundles. If they are not very frequent, they are going to be n-grams and that's it. Okay, as I always teach my students, all, n, all lexical bundles are n-grams, but not all n-grams are lexical bundles. So an n-gram is a, a group of two, three, four words, but nobody says how many times they have to repeat. Now, when they continue recurring and they meet those kind of points, they become bundles. That's it. I mean, it's not, there's no, no um, magic in them. Okay. And I think that that's it. Uh, are more questions? No. Oh, yes, there are more. Um, how would you suggest we teach EAP learners three word bundles, especially the grammatical only ones? Um, I, I would be, it would be very difficult to teach the grammatical only ones. I think that because the grammatical only, they go over grammatical units. Okay, so then I wouldn't teach them as bundles. I would teach them by grammatical units. So I would teach the preposition with the noun phrase and the article with the noun. Okay, I think that that is the best the best way to do it. I I usually teach the ones that are really functional with the functions. So then if if I am teaching. Um, and I, and I teach also the ones that come with, with semantic preferences. So for example, um, a set of, it would be very interesting to, see, to um, get examples from method sections because they are usually from method sections and um, that, that come accompanied by these research-oriented uh, words, okay, nouns, um, variables or um, samples, okay, or observations, for example. And so then teach that together, even when it is not a longer bundle, because, I mean, 
it becomes like a like a frame with an open end okay and then someone has two questions. I have been analyzing three and four word formulaic sequences in the written production of non-native EFL learners in the Cambridge Learner Corpus. As a reference native corpus, would it be suitable to use Loch Ness, which consists, um, okay, I particularly don't work with bundles in learner corpora because because of the way bundles are identified, there may be many expressions that learners try to um, um, produce, but because they are not producing the whole expression, the uh, program that identifies bundles is not going to identify it as a bundle. So if you have an expression like, on the other hand, and the learner wrote, on other hand, it's not going to be a bundle because there is a, there is a missing word there. There is an inappropriate use. So I wrote an article in 2018 with one of my students, um, Yu Qian Xin, um, and we have a third author, Dr. Yun, and we, um, we looked at um, uh, the use of um, definite articles and the use of bundles in non-native speakers. And we found out that... Um, non-native speakers were using less bundles than um, regular native speakers, but it was not that they didn't know the bundle, is that they were leaving a word out. And so then when the bundles program tried to identify those bundles, it would not because there was a missing word. So instead of, I don't know, um, as a result of, it would be as a result of without the A, and then it wouldn't come up as a bundle. So I think that those are things that you really need to take into account in the study of bundles, that because they are a unit that is like that, it's going to, if, if, the, um, if the production has inappropriate grammatical use and there are missing words like articles or prepositions, the bundles are not going to, and, and that is something that, uh, many published articles, uh, studies that have uh, looked at learner corpora always claim that non-native speakers use less bundles than native speakers, but but we really don't know if that's if that's the case. Probably the non-native speaker tried to use the bundle, but because there is one inappropriate use, there is one word that is missed, uh, the, the, the whole expression is not counted as a bundle, okay? So, um, so I think that that is the that is the problem there. Um, no, I think that um, that it's in, uh, here is a question that says um, four word bundles hold three word bundles in their structure. So should I omit three word bundles and look only at four word bundles only if you have three word bundles that are a hundred percent embedded in four word bundles? So then just go with four word bundles. But if you have expressions that have three words and they can be bundles on their own, I think that they are worth investigating. Okay. Um, that's it, I think, oh no, there are more. Okay, um, where there are other papers of yours on lexical bundles, uh, send me an email and I'll send you it. I don't know what you want, but I mean, yeah, I have like more than 20, so I can, I'm sure that I can share something with you. Um, it says, um, we don't usually use relative frequency when working with lexical bundles. Could you tell me a little more? Uh, um, do you mean why I don't normalize or we don't usually normalize? We usually use raw frequencies with bundles because, um, because as the bundle is an expression that has to meet a cutoff point, then you really need to work with those raw, ex raw um, frequencies. The moment that you start normalizing then you come to a point in which anything can be a bundle. And I'm going to give you one example. So imagine that in my case, I decide that I have a one million word corpus. And for me, all four word expressions that repeat 20 times are going to be bundles. Now, imagine that I work with a corpus that has, I don't know, um, 10,000 words. And I said, oh, I want to I wanna normalize. So probably an expression that repeats once 
normalized to a million is going to repeat 20 times. But that may or may not happen. So I did a study when I was doing my dissertation with, that we have to pilot all these things. I did a study in which I started with a very small corpus, 25,000 words. And then I started adding to that corpus to see what happened. So the first number of bundles that I got, I had two expressions. This is my best example. One was as a result of, and the other was as a consequence of. Um, four words, as a result of the, as a consequence of the. So in my 25,000 um, word corpus, both of those expressions appeared five times. So you can say, wow, if you normalize, both are bundles. For sure, in a million, they are going to appear over 20 times. Well, they don't, because when you continue collecting, as a result of, grows exponentially. And as a consequence of, it stays there. It only repeated six times when I got to a million words. So I did the same study starting in 25, 50, 100, 200, uh, 500,000, 100,000, um, a, a million. And so then when I got to a million, there were some expressions that had grown exponentially and there were some expressions that had not. So this normalization doesn't work with bundles. So that's all I can tell you. Um, there's a, there's, there are some papers that were written by statistics people, particularly Yves Bestken uh, from Louvain, and he has worked a lot on bundles and um, like uh, why not normalizing. And, um, and he, he's always sending me papers about the things that he writes. He's a statistician and a computational linguist, so he does a lot of tests on what can be used and what is not really reliable. Okay, I think I have a couple of minutes more. Um, for pedagogical implications for low-level language learners, do you just suggest explicit teaching methods? Do you have a, spe a specific method? Um, I think that if you are teaching, for example, conversational and um, communicative approach um, in low level, you can very well, I mean, I'm sure that you are teaching a lot of bundles, but you don't know, okay? Um, I think that the idea is always teach the bundle and the function. That's the most important thing. And if you have, if you can teach by function, you can use a lot of expressions. You can teach a lot of expressions that go with that particular function. Um, and I think this is the last one. May I have some of your papers on lexical bundles? Okay, just send me an email. Um, I put my email and everybody knows that I'm it's vcortez at gsu.edu and I can attach a couple of papers. And I think that that's the last question. Thank you so much. Viviana, um, <clears throat> can I ask you a question too? Um, sure. It's just that, I, you know, when you do uh, the extraction for lexical bundles, uh, you want to get the most frequent ones, right? As you said, but at the same time, you want to have many lexical bundles. Otherwise, you get just a short list of bundles that will not be very frequent in the texts. And so uh, I was wondering, how can you balance these two settings, you know, robustness and sparseness? so that you get very good and real strong bundles, but at the same time, a whole lot of them so that you can have a good sample. I, I'm not interested in a whole lot of them because, right. because, I, because my main interest is to teach them. And I know that I'm gonna have to select anyway, because it's the same as vocabulary. You know that there are hundreds of vocabulary lists and then you don't know what to do with those because you have so many words and your students can only digest a minor number. So I think that, no, I'm not interested in how many. I am in really interested in the fact that they need to be really frequent so that I am completely, completely sure that those words have a reason for, come to, for coming together so frequently, okay? Um, at the beginning, I think that uh, Biber was saying something like, these words come together um, like a defe defeating chance. Okay, so it's like they, so that then there's, the, if, if the, there was a chance that these four words have to come together, these, these three words have to come together, they come so frequently that there's no chance that it's just by chance. Okay, but, um, but I think that in these days, 
um, I am really interested in, in looking at things that because they are so frequent, they become salient, okay? Because it's like your students are going to be your students are going to be receiving those or being exposed to those expressions much more frequently than many other things. So probably if you can identify those, you can make like a better informed decisions on what to teach. So that's why I'm telling you, when I was looking at the three word bundles, I'm sure that between 240 and 100, there are a lot of expressions that are also interesting. But there is a moment in which you have to put your own limits. You say, I mean, this is all I can analyze for this study. So I'm going to go till here, which, I mean, 60 in a, in a million words is like a decent cut of point for three word bundles. In fact, it's a bit low for me because I would have said 100 in a million. Because I really want to be sure that those expressions are reflecting the frequency, which is like, it's the only thing that makes them special. Yes, okay. and um, thank you. And uh, we have some five minutes. Would you mind uh, going back to the Q&A? We have a couple more questions. Oh, okay. Claudia and gang. Yeah. Oh, Claudia. Let me see where Claudia is. Okay, Claudia. Um, they are, you, you are doing collocational MD. Have you done collocation? Are you have you done a lexical bundle MD? No, we have not. Uh, we have done the collocational MD, but <laughs> not the <laughs> bundle MD. <laughs> no, I mean no. We we haven't done bundle MD. I mean bundles usually come as a as a feature in regular MDs. Okay, so it's like the Bible when he does MDs bundles is is one of the features but not just for bundles no i would claudia i would leave that to tony a hundred percent okay um and then um the set of could it be disciplinary specific use since your corpus consists of different disciplines some of the differences would use with more frequency it could be i didn't look at that for this study but it could be like in the 2013 paper in that study i didn't my corpus was not well balanced for disciplines and um, so i my results didn't report discipline specific but it bundles, but I um, I suggested that there were bundles that were prone to appear in one discipline and not in another. Okay, the same happens with moves. Okay, because these moves and steps are discipline specific too. So there are some disciplines in which they appear in in all the papers. In some others, they appear in some papers, and in some others, they don't. So. Since you're um, talking about the set of, can I actually ask? Sorry, I'm out of mind not posting the, the no question. Problem. So you mentioned that the um, the fourth, I guess that'd be like a variable slot, and they seem to be sort of research oriented words. Like, what was it variables? And but um, I was wondering, would it would a more appropriate um, way be that those are all category words or group words, right? They're all like the names of categories. Yeah, for some of them they are like like a sample or a or a, uh, um, a variable. So it is they are like group words. Yeah, and that's why it comes with a set. Okay, yeah, a set right. of something that is a set. Okay, I means not going to be a set of. It could be a set of chairs, but yeah. probably not a set of beds. But it, would, it wouldn't okay. have to be. Sorry, it, it wouldn't have to be research. Oriented. No, but uh, but in this particular but in this particular corpus, ninety percent of the words were research oriented words. So then it's okay. It would be nice, uh, like following the question from um, from the audience. Um, it would be nice to see if they come from a particular field. Like for example, um, when I did the um, the bundles that are longer, and I found these nine and ten word bundles, I found these very organi organizational bundles. Like the rest of the paper will be organized as follows, or the paper is organized as follows. And all of those bundles came from 
business, sorry, it was business, marketing, economics, finance, all of, the, of those bundles came from those journals. So I couldn't make a one-on-one -on -one connection because the corpus was not really very uh, well balanced, but I could draw those conclusions because it was very telling. I mean, you could see where all those expressions came from. It repeated 18 times and those 18 times it, it came from all those journals. There was no, no journal from applied linguistics or uh, from biology. It was all from those um, financial journals, uh, financial disciplines. So, yeah, I mean, that, th those are, can you see, those are things that people can do. So come on, use that, continue with your research, because I mean, it would be nice to have many more studies of bundles, but there are not so many, in fact. Um, I think that people tr tend to replicate, okay? So it's like someone did a study in biology, they want to do a study in chemistry. But the idea is we need to continue moving along. So, for example, these days, I really don't feel happy when I see a study that just looks at, identifies the bundles, looks at the structure and the functions. I really want to see the connection with the communicative function, and I also want to see the prosodies and the preferences that come around the bundle, the position of the bundle in the center, so that there's so much that you can say about the bundle. I mean, 20 years ago, when we did like the 20, 2004 uh, article, um, um, have a look at, take a look at, if you look at. Uh, so that, that's the one in Applied Linguistics where we presented the functional taxonomy. We have never done anything like that before. So nowadays, everybody uses that taxonomy without paying attention to what we said that we went with the most frequent functions, but that doesn't mean that a bundle cannot have other functions which in fact they do. And so then sometimes people, students of mine come to me and they said, I found this bundle, but in the 2004 article, you say this bundle is referential. But for me, this bundle is like, yeah, show me your examples. Yes, you're right. He's like, and so the 2004 article, have you read it carefully? <laughs> Probably not, okay? So it's like, those are things that we really need to be careful about. Awesome, great.